uh, on the second night of Project Literacy Lab. And um, I actually really want to start with why we're all here. Um, you know, we've heard the stats around 758 million people um, are illiterate across the world. But as one of the board members of Pearson, why are you here? Why, why does Pearson care about illiteracy? then education is at the heart of every It's a fantastic motto. And so the entrepreneurs who are here are helping Pearson become better, as well as helping every community where the entrepreneurs work is being carried out. Mm -hmm. So for us, this is, as Kate James said, almost a, a positive proof of what our institution is all about. And for me as a board member, you know, I have voted the, the budget for project literacy. I have voted <laughs> staff presentation. But nothing is nothing matches being here and seeing really what's going on. It's really quite inspiring to be with you who are making a difference in so many different ways in communities across this country and indeed around the world. Most of my life on a college campus to see the kind of creativity uh, and basically uh, a scale here. Yeah. Um, so let's let's actually dive into that a little bit around your your time at Yale and and even before that. I think you've been in education for like forty years. Not right. <laughs> <laughs> um, where did you get your start in education? Well, I, um, like all of us, went to school, and for me, it <laughs> yeah. was a fantastic enterprise. It was a, a wonderful opening, and then when I went to law school at Yale, I had the chance to be the student intern to the then president of the university, who himself was a lawyer, and then when I was practicing law uh, in New York City, they all of a sudden decided they wanted to start a general counsel's office, uh, which shows how long ago there was not even general counsels wow. at universities at the time. So came back and started that office and then realized I really didn't care about the law. I really cared about education. Mm -hmm. And so I transferred over to the academic side of the house and from there really had the opportunity to build. I was really a builder and built all kinds of academic units that the university didn't have at the time and which I found wonderful people inside Yale and outside of Yale to partner with. Amazing. I, uh, I actually that you're a pretty good student. Uh, you, you were valedictorian of your class, <laughs> you know. Um, I think you were also student body president. Uh, is that, uh, I mean, that, that's is that, is that accurate? <laughs> <laughs> is Wikipedia oh, correct that's, that's on right. that? <laughs> um, you have to care about your sources, yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm just wondering, like, at that time, walk us through what your drive was. What, where did that come from? I think it And he, the only way he could go to college was to go to the United States Naval Academy. And then he found himself in an operation um, of flying airplanes, uh, first generation jet planes. And he said, I can't believe people pay me to fly. <laughs> and uh, and that therefore the sense that you could, l the sky was the limit quite literally. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that was an issue. Go and figure out where your passion is and where you can make a difference. Wow. And how have you carried that through out your career? Because I mean, from Yale, uh, where did you go? Uh, how did you end up as a, a, a member of the board of the world's largest education company? I guess you should really ask some other people in this room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I um, had my main career in, in education, yeah. but I've been very fortunate because I had the chance to be plucked when I was quite young. I was probably in my 30s mm -hmm. for my first corporate board. Yeah. Uh, and then I think there really was then, and probably still is, too much of an old boys network. And so since I found myself on one board, then a variety of these folks said, well, you know, she's not too bad, and then we'll find her <laughs> here, and not too bad, and go over here. And so it was one thing led to another. Yeah. Uh, but I think in the case of Pearson, it was the, uh, uh, the sort of uh, intersection of the fact that I had built Yale's overseas uh, projects uh, really around the world. Mm -hmm. We had about 80 different units, research or, ac or academic around the world, and that I built our digital online learning. And so the combination of those I think might have um, 
tempted them to think maybe I can make a difference. I'm, I, I, I hope it's proven <laughs> out, but that, that was probably the, the value proposition that I brought. Amazing. And uh, just diving into the, you know, the, the boys club a little bit, um, I, I'm, I'm curious as uh, an amazing you know, female leader or a leader in your own right, but then to be going through that and challenging status quos and challenging folks and positions you made it sound really easy the way you just described it. Well, um, was it was it that easy? You know, it, especially in the context of the national debate right now, yeah. in which we can be shocked and surprised and dismayed about the areas in which women are not being given their full respect. Um, I have to say, it's I think imperative for everyone to say how important it is to have true respect and gender e equity and progress. And so I, I did have uh, men, actually, who believed in me long believed before I believed in myself. Mm -hmm. And that made a real difference throughout my career, uh, which is not to say that I did not. I wouldn't say nightmares, but memories of things that did not go so well. Yeah. Uh, being a, a young woman attorney on Wall Street in the 70s uh, had its own challenges. Um, but higher education, I think, was, has been, for me, much, much better. But I'll say, and Pearson is a great example of where you see women's achievements. It's thrilling uh, in an era in which so many corporate boards still maybe have only one or two women yeah. to see the percentage of women on the Pearson board, to see the women like Kate James who are there at the inner circle of senior management um, is, really makes a difference. And so it is a company that practices what it preaches mm. in terms of advancement for women and for men and women of color. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, uh, not, to, not to, I'm not challenging, but I am curious, what do you think women bring to the equation? Well, first of all, I think that women bring the same thing that men do if they're selected for these jobs. I think that's the most important thing, which is you hope they would bring a sense of commitment to the enterprise, and they bring some special talents. Uh, we have a woman who's been a CEO of a major financial institution, a woman who's been the sort of number two or three at BP. Yeah. Uh, we have, um, you know, Kate who's been at Gates and is now our chief uh, marketing organization. So I think the first thing is that they are there on their merits. Yeah. That's one. And then I do think, though, from my experience on these um, other corporate boards as well, is that women are more likely to ask the follow-up question about the sense of equity in the workplace. And I don't mean for the betterment of women only. I mean for the betterment of men and women yeah. in terms of what are the issues for childcare? What are the issues for personal time? How can you have flexible time? I think these issues are increasingly important for the welfare of men and families as well as women and families. Mm -hmm. Almost making business more human. Yes. Not a bad thing. Not a bad thing at all. <laughs> um, now, I'm, I, I am curious. Uh, there's there's some wild stuff on Wikipedia, um, and I, I've got to check. I've got to check. I've got to check. Um, you you you, uh, you have an award from the government of Argentina, like an Order of Merit. I, we need the story on what that is, how you have an order of merit from the government of Argentina. Well, this actually uh, is, is a fun story okay. because uh, one of the research units that I opened up uh, was in, in Argentina. And it was a great partnership between one of their uh, established medical schools and our medical school, really trying to have one and one be three in terms of looking at path-breaking uh, scientific research in terms of some uh, genetic defects that seem to be much more prevalent uh, in that country. Uh, and so we had, you know, we, we opened it up. And then I also think that they all always were interested in having greater linkages, particularly in the Clinton administration years, between the U.S. and Argentina. So they, they had these various awards, and so we had it. But the best thing about it was, it was at the embassy. It was a fantastic <laughs> evening. And they brought in these uh, incredible dancers doing the tango dance. You know, it's all, uh, I'll remember not so much the award, but the uh, great <laughs> artistry of, of that evening. So. I but I must it. say, whenever I go to Argentina, as I do with some uh, regularity, um, it's it's in my passport, or it's in the passport records. And so I do get it sw swept through uh, <laughs> customs very quickly. Uh, I know who to travel with to Argentina now. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So now I, I'd love to actually just look at some of the tougher sides of your journey. Um, uh, I can't imagine it has been an easy one. Um, and for a lot of the entrepreneurs in the room, uh, there are great days and there are really tough days. And I'm wondering what one of your toughest days might have been and, and what happened to make it so tough. Well, let me give you two because they're very, yeah. very different. Yeah. Um, the first may be more conventional business type, which is that I um, was uh, and am a product of a women's college. I believe in women's education and a, a college, the oldest women's college in my home state of Virginia, uh, had a need of her president and they asked me to fill that role and I was 34 years old. I was too young to recognize that one should have thought longer and harder about this since I had two children, both still in diapers at the time. Um, and the day I arrived, it became clear that they had missed their enrollment uh, targets by 35%. If you are a tuition-driven institution, that is a big hole. And unlike sort of missing an inventory on the shelf, it's a four-year problem, right? Because yeah. it goes all the way through. So having to help turn that around, uh, particularly with um, a faculty who thought that I um, should have been a student and not their uh, president, uh, was was a challenging, but it was wonderful to work for with them, to pull this community get together, and then have it a couple years later being as strong as it had ever been. So that that was a challenging time. Um, on, on that one, I'm curious, what did you learn in that experience? Because we have a lot of founders that are young, that are leading teams that are, you know, five, ten years, twenty years older than them. Like, how do you how do you lead in that kind of a dynamic with that kind of pressure? Well, I think if you are smart, and all the entrepreneurs here, I feel that, yeah. is that you have to be open and humble. I mean, you have to say, what can we learn here together? And so it's not so much the command and control, certainly as a 34-year-old, uh, but it's that I need to tap each person here to be their best self, because we're not going to talk. Individuals are not called upon to really be their best selves. And so that's sort of a genuine need to draw upon people, uh, I think can make a real difference. Mm. Nice. The other one is something that I bet no entrepreneur probably ever have to face, um, but there are times, perhaps there are some analogies, and that um, I was a person at Yale that if a student died, I called their parents. Mm. And every single one of those cases is etched on my heart and I can recall every bit of it. Um, and so that is, I guess the analogy could be, is that trying your hardest, things can go very bad. And not just very bad in terms of missing a tuition target, or missing a, a quarter results, but very bad in the most important dimension of the human scale. And that what you have to do is to really figure out how you help one another. Because what is needed in that situation is not in some game book. It really has to be sort of in your heart and recognizing how you connect with the people and what they need. Mm -hmm. um, but I will have to say, when I retired, I, that was not a responsibility that I was in any way disappointed to give up. Yeah, I mm -hmm. can imagine. Um, and it, on retirement, I, I think they uh, also maybe named even an award after you as well at, at Yale. <laughs> they, what, what's that about? Well, that, I have to say, this was like the best goodbye present I could have ever had, yeah. which is that um, Yale has, like most colleges, gives student awards at graduation, and they have uh, And so the trustees created it for me. And in fact, the reason I have to leave tomorrow is that they're, oh, the annual award is being given tomorrow afternoon. So wow. It's very wow. fun. So. It's definitely a good reason uh, to, to leave us. But... Um, so, you know, we don't have too much more time, but I want to bring us back to the present. And um, as really someone who is helping architect the future of education, we've seen so much news about what's happening with digital and how digital is disrupting the space. What do you see happening, and where do you see Pearson and entrepreneurs like the ones we have here fitting in that uh, new reality? 
I think you know the idea of an avalanche is sort of a devastating aspect. But if you take avalanche as velocity, I think what it means we're going to see a velocity of change in education. And what we're going to see is new sorts of partnerships. And there are going to be partnerships between traditional educational institutions and places like Pearson and places like we're, we're experiencing today, yeah. and as well as with government. So I think that it's going to be a whole new landscape. But what we're going to see is innovation like we've never seen before, and it's going to be fueled by entrepreneurs like you're bringing together here. Amazing. And uh, maybe in closing, what would be your advice? Um, to entrepreneurs that are looking to tap into that velocity? Like, what, it, what is the wisdom that they should be keeping at the front of their minds? Well, in just getting to know some of these great entrepreneurs who are here, particularly those who are at the beginning of their journey, who may only have five, six, seven employees at this time and have been doing so much on their own back, um, I would say try and take a deep breath and try and find your kitchen cabinet, your brain trust, your board of advisors. Don't wait until you have an IPO where you're going to have a board of directors foisted upon you. I hope that just like the mentors here are a source of some wisdom, that you can find your own continuous source of a, of a few people who will be sort of have your back and will help push you for your own velocity. Amazing. Well, Linda, I wish you could literally spend the whole night uh, you know, having this conversation and I can't thank you enough for not only your leadership at Pearson but for helping make this possible. Um, it is like uh, not only a pleasure to have you involved but an honor to be able to um, hopefully tap into that avalanche with you. So thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you.